one how captain sword marched to war from captain sword and captain pen by lee hunt read for librivox dot org by nemo one how captain sword marched to war captain sword got up one day over the hills to march away over the hills and through the towns they heard him coming across the downs stepping in music and thunder sweet which his drum sent before him into the street and lo twas a beautiful sight in the sun for first came his foot all marching like one with tranquil faces and bristling steel and the flag full of honour as though it could feel and the officers gentle the sword that hold against the shoulder heavy with trembling gold and the massy tread that in passing is heard though the drums and the music say never a word and then came his horse a clustering sound of shapely potency forward bound glossy black steeds and riders tall rank after rank each looking like all midst moving repose and a threatening charm with mortal sharpness at each right arm and hues that painters and ladies love in ever the small flag blushed above and ever and anon the kettle drums beat hasty power midst order meet and ever and anon the drums and fifes came like motion's voice and life's or into the golden grandeurs fell of deeper instruments mingling well burdens of beauty for winds to bear and the cymbals kissed in the shining air and the trumpets their visible voices reared each looking forth with its tapestried beard bidding the heavens and the earth make way for captain sword and his battle array he nevertheless rode indifferent eyed as if pomp were a toy to his manly pride whilst the ladies loved him the more for his scorn and thought him the noblest man ever was born and tears came into the bravest eyes and hearts swelled after him double their size and all that was weak and all that was strong seemed to think wrongs self in him could not be wrong such love though with bosom about to be gored did sympathy get for brave captain sword so half that night as he stopped in the town twas all one dance going merrily down with lights and windows and love and eyes and a constant feeling of sweet surprise but all the next morning twas tears and sighs for the sound of his drums grew less and less walking like carelessness off from distress and captain sword went whistling gay over the hills and far away end a poem this recording is in the public domain two how captain sword won a great victory from captain sword and captain pen by lee hunt read for librivox dot org by nemo two how captain sword won a great victory through fair and through foul went captain sword pacer of highway and piercer of ford steady of face and rain or sun he and his merry men all is one till they came to a place where in battle array stood thousands of faces firm as they waiting to see which could best maintain bloody argument lords of pain and down the throats of their fellow-men thrust the draught never drunk again it was a spot of rural peace ripening with the year's increase and singing in the sun with birds like a maiden with happy words with happy words which she scarcely hears in her own contented ears such abundance feeleth she of all comfort carelessly throwing round her as she goes sweet half-thoughts on lily and rose 
nor guesseth what will soon arouse all ears that murders in the house and that in some strange wrong of brain her father hath her mother slain steady steady the masses of men wheel and fall in and wheel again softly as circles drawn with pen then a gaze there was in valor and fear and the jest that died in the jester's ear in preparation noble to see of all accepting mortality tranquil necessity gracing force and the trumpets danced with a stirring horse and lordly voices here and there called to war through the gentle air when suddenly with its voice of doom spoke the cannon twixt glare and gloom making wider the dreadful room on the faces of nations round fell the shadow of that sound death for death the storm begins rush the drums in a torrent of dins crash the muskets gash the swords shoes grow red in a thousand fords now for the flint and the cartridge bite darkly gathers the breath of the fight salt to the palate and stinging to sight muskets are pointed they scarce know where no matter murder is cluttering there reel the hollows close up close up death feeds thick and his food in his cup down go bodies snap burst eyes trod on the ground are tender cries brains are dashed against plashing ears ha no time has battle for tears cursing helps better cursing that goes slipping through friends blood a thirst for foes what have soldiers with tears to do we who this mad house must now go through this twenty-fold bedlam let loose with knives to murder and stab and grow liquid with lives gasping staring treading red mud till the drunkenness self makes a study of blood oh shrink not thou reader thy parts in it too hast not thy praise made the thing they go through shocking to read of but noble to do no time to be breather of thoughtful breath has the giver and taker of dreadful death see where comes the hoarse tempest again visible earthquake bloody of main part are upon us with edges of pain part burst riderless over the plain crashing their spurs and twice slaying the slain see by the living god see those foot charging down hill hot hurried and mute they loll their tongues out aha pell-mell horses roll in a human hell horse and man they climb one another which is the beast and which is the brother mangling stifling stopping shrieks with a tread of torn out cheeks drinking each other's bloody breath here's the fleshiest feast of death an odor as of a slaughter house the distant raven's dark eye bows victory victory man flies man cannibal patience hath done what it can carved and been carved drunk the drinkers down and now there is one that hath won the crown one pale visage stands lord of the board joy to the trumpets of captain sword his trumpets blow strength his trumpets neigh they and his horse and waft him away they and his foot with a tired proud flow tattered escapers and givers of woe open ye cities hats off hold breath to see the man who has been with death to see the man who determineth right by the virtue perplexing virtue of might sudden before him have ceased the drums and lo in the air of empire he comes all things present in earth and sky seem to look at his looking eye end a poem this recording is in the public domain
three of the ball that was given to captain sword from captain sword and captain pen by lee hunt read for librivox dot org by nemo three of the ball that was given to captain sword but captain sword was a man among men and he hath become their playmate again boot nor sword nor stern look hath he but holdeth the hand of a fair lady and floweth the dance a palace within half the night to a golden din midst lights and windows and love and eyes and a constant feeling of sweet surprise and ever the look of captain sword is the look that's thanked and the look that's adored there was the country dance small of taste and the waltz that loveth the lady's waist and the galopade strange agreeable tramp made of a scrape a hobble and stamp and the high-stepping minuet face to face mutual worship of conscious grace and all the shapes in which beauty goes weaving motion with blithe repose and then a table of feast displayed like a garden of light without a shade all of gold and flowers and sweets with wines of old churchlands and sylvan meats food that maketh the blood feel choice yet all the face of the feast and the voice and heart still turn to the head of the board for ever the look of captain sword is the look that's thanked and the look that's adored well content was captain sword at his feet all wealth was poured on his head all glory set for his ease all comfort met and around him seemed entwined all the arms of womankind and when he had taken his fill thus of all the pampereth will in his down he sunk to rest clasped in dreams of all its best End a poem. This recording is in the public domain. Four, on what took place on the field of battle, the night after the victory, from Captain Sword and Captain Pen, by Lee Hunt, read for LibriVox.org, by Nemo. Four on what took place on the field of battle the night after the victory tis a wild night out of doors the wind is mad upon the moors and comes into the rocking town stabbing all things up and down and then there is a weeping rain huddling against the window pane and good men bless themselves in bed the mother brings her infant's head closer with a joy like tears and thinks of angels in her prayers then sleeps with his small hand in hers two loving women lingering yet ere the fire is out are met talking sweetly time beguiled one of her bridegroom one her child the bridegroom he they have received happy letters more believed for public news and feel the bliss the heavenly are on a night like this they think him housed they think him blessed curtained in the core of rest danger distant all good near why hath their good night a tear behold him by a ditch he lies clutching the wet earth his eyes beginning to be mad in vain his tongue still thirst to lick the rain that mocked but now his homeward tears and ever and anon he rears his legs and knees with all their strength and then is strongly thrust at length raised or stretched he cannot bear the wound that girds him weltering there and water he cries with moonward stare i will not read it with a start burning cry some honest heart i will not read it why endure pangs which horror cannot cure why 
oh why and rob the brave and the bereaved of all they crave a little hope to gild the grave askest thou why thou honest heart tis because thou dost ask and because thou dost start tis because thine own praise and fond outward thought have aided the shows which this sorrow have wrought a wound unutterable oh god mingles his being with the sod i'll read no more thou must thou must in thine own pang doth wisdom trust his nails are in earth his eyes in air and water he crieth he may not forbear brave and good was he yet now he dreams the moon looks cruel and he blasphemes no more no more nay this is but one were the whole tale told it would not be done from wonderful setting to rising sun but god's good time is at hand be calm thou reader and steep thee in all thy balm of tears or patience of thought or good will for the field the field waiteth us still water water all over the field to nothing but death will that wound voice yield one as he crieth is sitting half bent what holds he so close his body is rent another is mouthless with eyes on cheek unto the raven he may not speak one would fain kill him and one half round the place where he writhes hath up beaten the ground like a mad horse hath he beaten the ground and the feathers and music that litter it round the gore and the mud and the golden sound come hither ye cities ye ballrooms take breath see what a floor hath the dance of death the floor is alive though the lights are out what are those dark shapes flitting about flitting about yet no ravens they not foes yet not friends mute creatures of prey their prey is lucre their claws a knife some say they take the beseeching life horrible pity is theirs for despair and they the love's sacred limbs leave bare love will come to-morrow and sadness patient for the fear of madness and shut its eyes for cruelty so many pale beds to see turn away thou love and weep no more in covering his last sleep thou hast him blessed is thine eye friendless famine has yet to die a shriek great god what superhuman peal was that not man nor woman nor twenty madmen crushed could reek their soul in such a ponderous shriek dumbly for an instant stares the field and creep men's dying hairs o friend of man o noble creature patient and brave and mild by nature mild by nature and mute as mild why brings he to these passes wild thee gentle horse thou shape of beauty could he not do his dreadful duty if duty it be which seems mad folly nor link thee to his melancholy two noble steeds lay side by side one cropped the meek grass ere it died pang struck it struck the other already torn and out of its bowels that shriek was born now see what crawleth well as it may out of the ditch and looketh that way what horror all black in the sick moonlight kneeling half human a burdensome sight loathly and liquid as fly from a dish speak horror thou for it withereth flesh 
the grass caught fire the wounded were by writhing till eve did a remnant lie then feebly this coal abateth his cry but he hopeth he hopeth joy lighteth his eye for gold he possesseth and murder is nigh o oh, goodness and horror o oh, ill not all ill and the worst of the worst may be fierce hope still to-morrow with dawn will come many a wane and bear away loads of human pain piles of pale beds for the hospitals but some again will wake in home mornings and some dull herds of the war again follow the drum from others faint blood shall in families flow with wonder at life and young oldness and woe yet hence may the movers of great earth grow now even now i hear them at hand though again captain sword is up in the land marching anew for more fields like these than the health of his flag in the morning breeze sneereth the trumpet and stampeth the drum and again captain sword in his pride doth come he passeth the fields where his friends lie lorn feeding the flowers and the feeding corn where under the sunshine cold they lie and he hasteth a tear from his old gray eye small thinking is his but work to be done and onward he marcheth using the sun he slayeth he wasteth he spouteth his fires on babes at the bosom and bedrid sires he bursteth pale cities through smoke and through yell and bringeth behind him hot-blooded his hell then the weak door is barred and the soul all sore in hand-wringing helplessness paceth the floor and the lover is slain and the parents are nigh oh god let me breathe and look up at thy sky good as hundreds evil as one round about goeth the golden sun end a poem this recording is in the public domain How Captain Sword, in consequence of his great victories, became infirm in his wits. From Captain Sword and Captain Pen by Lee Hunt. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. But to win at the game, whose moves are death, it maketh a man draw too proud a breath. And to see his force taken from reason and right, it tendeth to unsettle his reason quite never did chief of the line of sword keep his wits whole at that drunken board he taketh the sighs and the roar and fate of the field of his action for soul as great he smiteth and stunneth the cheek of mankind and saith lo i rule both body and mind captain sword forgot his own soul which of aught save itself resented control which whatever his deeds ordained them still bodiless monarch enthroned in his will he forgot the close thought and the burning heart and prayers and the mild moon hanging apart which lifteth the seas with her gentle looks and growth and death and immortal books and the infinite mildness the soul of souls which layeth earth soft twixt her silver poles which ruleth the stars and saith not a word whose speed in the hair of no comet is heard which sendeth the soft sun day by day mighty and genial and just alway owning no difference doing no wrong loving the orbs and the least bird's song the great sweet warm angel with golden rod bright with a smile of the distance of god captain sword like a witless thing of all under heaven must needs be king king of kings and lord of lords swayer of souls as well as of swords ruler of speech and through speech of thought and hence to his brain was a madness brought he maddened in east and maddened in west fiercer for sights of men's unrest fiercer for talk amongst awful men of their new mighty leader captain pen a conqueror strange who sat in his home 
like the wizard that plagued the ships of rome noiseless showless dealing no death but victories winged went forth from his breath three thousand miles across the waves did captain sword cry bidding souls be slaves three thousand miles did the ebb return with a laugh and a blow made his old cheeks burn then he called to a wrong maddened people and swore their name in the map should never be more dire came the laugh and smote worse than before were earthquake a giant up thrusting his head and o'erlooking the nations not worse were the dread then lo was a wonder and sadness to see for with that very people their leader stood he incarnate afresh like a caesar of old but because he looked back and his heart was cold time hope and himself for a tale he sold o largest occasion by man ever lost o throne of the world to the war dogs tossed he vanished and thinly there stood in his place the new shape of sword with an umbler face rebuking his brother and preaching for right yet i when it came standing proud on his might and squaring its claims with his old small sight then struck up his drums with ensign furled and said i will walk through a subject world earth just as it is shall for ever endure the rich be too rich the poor too poor and for this i'll stop knowledge i'll say to it flow thus far but presume no farther to flow for me as i list shall the free airs blow laughed after him loudly that land so fair the king thou settest over us by a free air is swept away senseless and old sword then first knew the might of great captain pen so strangely it bowed to him so wildered his brain that now he stood hatless renouncing his reign now muttered of dust laid in blood and now twixt wonder and patience went lifting his brow then suddenly he came with gowned men and said now observe me i'm captain pen i'll lead your changes i'll write all your books i'm everything all things i'm clergymen cooks clerks carpenters hosiers i'm pitt i'm lord gray twas painful to see his extravagant way but heart ne'er so bold and hand ne'er so strong what are they when truth and the wits go wrong end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Of Captain Penn and How He Fought with Captain Sword. From Captain Sword and Captain Penn by Lee Hunt. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Now tidings of Captain Sword and his state were brought to the ears of Penn the Great, who rose and said, His time is come and he sent him but not by sound of drum nor trumpet nor other hasty breath hot with questions of life and death but only a letter calm and mild and captain sword he read it and smiled and said half in scorn and nothing in fear though his wits seemed restored by a danger near for brave was he ever let captain pen bring at his back a million men and i'll talk with his wisdom and not till then and replied to his messenger captain pen i'll bring at my back a world of men out left the captains of captain sword but their chief looked vexed and said not a word for thought and trouble had touched his ears beyond the bullet-like sense of theirs and wherever he went he was ware of a sound now heard in the distance now gathering round which irked him to know what the issue might be but the soul of the cause of it well guessed he indestructible souls among men were the souls of the line of captain pen sages patriots martyrs mild going to the stake as a child goeth with his prayer to bed 
dungeon beams from quenchless head poets making earth aware of its wealth in good and fair and the benders to their intent of metal and of element of flame the enlightener beauteous and steam that bursteth his iron house and adamantine giants blind that without master have no mind heir to these and all their store was pen the power unknown of yore and as their might still created might and each worked for him by day and by night in wealth and wondrous means he grew fit to move the earth anew till his frame began to speak pause as when the thunders wake muttering in the beds of heaven then to sit the globe more even water he called and fire and haste which hath left old time displaced and iron mightiest now for pen each of his steps like an army of men sword little knew what was leaving him then and out of the witchcraft of their skill a creature he called to wait on his will half iron half vapour a dread to behold which evermore panted and evermore rolled and uttered his words a million fold forth sprang they in air downing rain like dew and men fed upon them and mighty they grew ears giddy with custom that sound might not hear but it woke up the rest like an earthquake near and that same night of the letter some strange compulsion of soul brought a sense of change and at midnight the sound grew into a roll as the sound of all gatherings from pole to pole from pole unto pole and from clime to clime like the roll of the wheels of the coming of time a sound as of cities and sounds as of swords sharpening and solemn and terrible words and laughter as solemn and thunderous drumming a tread as if all the world were coming and then was a lull and soft voices sweet called into music those terrible feet which rising on wings low the earth went round to the burn of their speed with a golden sound with a golden sound and a swift repose such as the blood in the young heart knows such as love knows when his tumult cease when all is quick and yet all is at peace and when captain sword got up next morn lo a new-faced world was born for not in anger nor pride would it show nor aught of the loftiness now found low nor would his own men strike a single blow not a blow for their old unconsidering lord would strike the golden soldiers of captain sword but weaponless all and wise they stood in the level dawn and calm brotherly good yet bowed to him they and kissed his hands for such were their new lord's commands lessons rather and brotherly plea reverence the past quoth he reverence the struggle and mystery and faces human in their pain nor is the least that could sustain cares of mighty wars and guide calmly where the red deaths ride but how what now cried captain sword not a blow for your general not even a word what traitors deserters ah no they cried but the game's at an end the wise won't play and where's your old spirit the same though another man may be strong without maiming his brother but enemies enemies whence should they come when all interchange what was known but to some but famine but plague worse evils by far oh last mighty rhetoric to charm us to war look round what has earth now at equably speeds to do with those foul and calamitous needs now it equably speeds and thoughtfully glows and its heart is open never to close still i can govern said captain sword fate i respect and i stick to my word and in truth so he did but the word was one he had sworn to all vanities under the sun to do for their conquerors the least could be done besides what had he with his worn-out story to do with the cause he had wronged 
and the glory no captain sword a sword was still he could not unteach his lordly will he could not attemper his single thought it might not be spent nor newly wrought and so like the tool of disused art he stood at his wall and rusted apart twas only for many souled captain pen to make a world of swordless men End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 of Captain Sword and Captain Pen, a poem. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Captain Sword and Captain Pen, a poem by Lee Hunt. Postscript Containing Some Remarks on War and Military Statesmen, Part 1. The object of this poem is to show the horrors of war, the false ideas of power produced in the minds of its leaders, and, by inference, the unfitness of those leaders for the government of the world. The author intends no more offence to any one than can be helped. He feels due admiration for that courage and energy, the supposed misdirection of which it deplores. He heartily acknowledges the probability that the supposed misdirection has been hitherto no misdirection, but a necessity. But he believes that the time has come when, by encouraging the disposition to question it, its services and its sufferings may be no longer required, and he would fain tear asunder the veil from the sore places of war, would show what has been hitherto kept concealed or not shown earnestly, and for the purpose would prove, at all events, that the time has come for putting an end to those phrases in the narrative of warfare, by which a suspicious delicacy is palmed upon the reader, who is told after everything has been done to excite his admiration of war, that his feelings are spared, a recital of its miseries, that a veil is drawn over them, a truce given to descriptions which only harrow up the soul, etc. Suppose it be necessary to harrow up the soul, in order that the soul be no longer harrowed, moralists and preachers do not deal after this tender fashion with moral or even physical consequences resulting from other evils why should they spare these why refuse to look their own effeminacy in the face their own gaudy and overweening encouragement of what they dare not contemplate in its results is a murder in the streets worth attending to a single wounded man worth carrying to the hospital and are all the murders and massacres in fields of wounded and the madness the conflagrations the famines the miseries of families and the rickety frames and melancholy bloods of posterity only fit to have an embroidered handkerchief thrown over them must ladies and gentlemen be called off that they must not look that way the sight is so shocking does it become us to let others endure what we cannot bear even to think of? Even if nothing else were to come of inquiries into the horrors of war, surely they would cry aloud for some better provision against their extremity after battle. For some regulated and certain assistance to the wounded and agonized, so that we might hear no longer of men left in cold misery all night writhing with torture of bodies stripped by prowlers perhaps murderers and of frenzied men the other day the darlings of their friends dying two and even several days after the battle of famine the field of waterloo was not completely cleared of its dead and dying till nearly a week surely large companies of men should be organized for the sole purpose of assisting in clearing away the field after battle 
they should be steady men not lightly admitted nor unpossessed of some knowledge of surgery and they should be attached to the surgeon's staff both sides would respect them for their office and keep them sacred from violence their duties would be too painful and useful to get them disrespected for not joining in the fight and possibly before long they would help to do away their own necessity by detailing what they beheld is that the reason why there is no such establishment the question is asked not in bitterness but to suggest a self-interrogation to the instincts of war i have not thought proper to put notes to the poem detailing the horrors which i have touched upon nor even to quote my authorities which are unfortunately too numerous and contain worse horrors still they are furnished by almost every history of a campaign in all quarters of the world circumstances so painful in a first attempt to render them public for their own sakes would i thought even meet with less attention in prose than in verse however less fitted they may appear for it at first sight verse if it has any enthusiasm at once demands and conciliates attention it proposes to say much and little and it associates with it the idea of something consolatory or otherwise sustaining but there is one prose specimen of these details which i will give because it made so great an impression on me in my youth that i never afterwards could help calling it to mind when war was spoken of and as i had a good deal to say on that subject having been a public journalist during one of the most interesting periods of modern history and never having been blinded into an admiration of war by the dazzle of victory the circumstance may help to show how salutary a record of this kind may be and what an impression the subject might be brought to make on society the passage is in a note to one of mr southey's poems the ode to horror and is introduced by another frightful record less horrible because there is not such agony implied in it nor is it alive i extract says mr southey the following picture of consummate horror from notes to a poem written in twelve syllable verse upon the campaign of seventeen ninety four and seventeen ninety five it was during the retreat to daventer we could not proceed a hundred yards without perceiving the dead bodies of men women children and horses in every direction one scene made an impression upon my memory which time will never be able to efface near another cart we perceived a stout-looking man and a beautiful young woman with an infant about seven months old at the breast all three frozen and dead the mother had most certainly expired in the act of suckling her child as with one breast exposed she lay upon the drifted snow the milk to all appearance in a stream drawn from the nipple by the babe and instantly congealed the infant seemed as if its lips had but just then been disengaged and it reposed its little head upon the mother's bosom with an overflow of milk frozen as it trickled from the mouth their countenance were perfectly composed and fresh resembling those of persons in a sound and tranquil slumber the following description he continues of a field of battle is in the words of one who passed over the field of Jama after du Moulier's victory it was on the third day after the victory obtained by general du Moulier over the austrians that i rode across the field of battle the scene lies on a waste common rendered then more dreary by the desertion of the miserable hovels before occupied by peasants everything that resembled a human habitation was desolated and for the most part they had been burnt or pulled down to prevent their affording shelter to the post of the contending armies the ground was ploughed up by the wheels of the artillery and wagons everything like herbage was trodden into mire broken carriages arms accoutrements dead horses and men were strewed over the heath this was the third day after the battle 
it was the beginning of november and for three days a bleak wind and heavy rain had continued incessantly there were still remaining alive several hundreds of horses and of the human victims of that dreadful fight i can speak with certainty of having seen more than four hundred men still living unsheltered without food and without any human assistance most of them confined to the spot where they had fallen by broken limbs the two armies had proceeded and abandoned these miserable wretches to their fate some of the dead persons appeared to have expired in the act of embracing each other two young french officers who were brothers had crawled under the side of a dead horse where they had contrived a kind of shelter by means of a cloak they were both mortally wounded and groaning for each other one very fine young man had just strength enough to drag himself out of a hollow partly filled with water and was laid upon a little hillock groaning with agony a grape shot had cut across the upper part of his belly and he was keeping in his bowels with a handkerchief and hat he begged of me to end his misery he complained of dreadful thirst i filled him the hat of a dead soldier of water which he nearly drank off at once and left him to that end of his wretchedness which could not be far distant i hope concludes mr southey i have always felt and expressed an honest and christian abhorrence of wars and of the systems that produce them but my ideas of their immediate horrors fell infinitely short of this authentic picture mr southey in his subsequent lives of conquerors and his other writings will hardly be thought to have acted up to this abhorrence of wars and of the systems that produce them nor is he to be blamed for qualifying his view of the subject equally blameless surely as they are to be held who have retained their old views especially by him who helped to impress them his friend mr wordsworth in the vivacity of his admonitions to hasty complaints of evil has gone so far as to say that carnage is god's daughter and thereby subjected himself to the scoffs of a late noble wit he is addressing the deity himself but thy most dreaded instrument is working out a pure intent is man arrayed for mutual slaughter yea carnage is thy daughter mr wordsworth is a great poet and a philosophical thinker in spite of his having here paid a tremendous compliment to a rhyme for unquestionably the word slaughter provoked him into that imperative yea and its subsequent venturous affiliation but the judgment to say no more of it is rash whatever the divine being intends by his permission or use of evil it becomes us to think the best of it but not to affirm the appropriation of the particulars to him under their worst appellation seeing that he has implanted in us a horror of them and a wish to do them away what it is right in him to do is one thing what it is proper in us to affirm that he actually does is another and above all it is idle to affirm what he intends to do forever and to have us eternally venerate and abstain from questioning an evil all good and evil and vice and virtue themselves might become confounded in the human mind by a like daring and humanity sit down under every buffet of misfortune without attempting to resist it which fortunately is impossible plato cut this knotty point better by regarding evil as a thing senseless and unmalignant indeed no philosopher regards anything as malignant or malignant for malignity's sake out of which or notwithstanding it good is worked and to be worked perhaps finally to the abolition of evil but whether this consummation be possible or not and even if the dark horrors of evil be necessary towards the enjoyment of the light of good still the horror must be maintained where the object is really horrible otherwise we but the more idly resist the contrast if necessary and what is worse endanger the chance of melioration 
if possible did war appear to me an inevitable evil i should be one of the last men to show it in any other than its holiday clothes i can appeal to writings before the public to testify whether i am in the habit of making the worst of anything or of not making it yield its utmost amount of good my inclinations as well as my reason lie all that way i am a passionate and grateful lover of all the beauties of the universe moral and material and the chief business of my life is to endeavour to give others the like fortunate affection but on the same principle i feel it my duty to look evil in the face in order to discover if it be capable of amendment and i do not see why the miseries of war are to be spared this interrogation simply because they are frightful and enormous men get rid of smaller evils which lie in their way nay of great ones and there appears to be no reason why they should not get rid of the greatest if they will but have the courage we have abolished inquisitions and the rack burnings for religion burnings for witchcraft hangings for forgery a great triumph in a commercial country much of the punishment of death in some countries all of it in others why not abolish war mr wordsworth writes no odes to tell us that the inquisition was god's daughter though lope de vega who was one of its officers might have done so and mr wordsworth too had he lived under its dispensation lope de vega like mr wordsworth and mr southey was a good man as well as a celebrated poet and we will concede to his memory what the english poets will perhaps not be equally disposed to grant for they are severe on the romish faith that even the inquisition like war might possibly have had some utility in its evil were it no other than a hastening of christianity by its startling contradictions of it yet it is gone the inquisition as war may be hereafter is no more daughter if it was of the supreme good it was no immortal daughter why should carnage be especially as god has put it in our heads to get rid of it i am aware of what may be said on these occasions to puzzle the will and i concede of course that mankind may entertain false values of their power to change anything for the better i concede that all change may be only in appearance and not make any real difference in the general amount of good and evil that evil to a certain invariable amount may be necessary to the amount of good the overbalance of which with the most hearty and loving sincerity i ever acknowledge and finally that all which the wisest of men could utter on any subject might possibly be nothing but a jargon the witless and puny voice of what we take to be a mighty orb but which after all is only a particle in the starry dust of the universe on the other hand all this may be something very different from what we take it to be setting aside even the opinions which consider mind as everything and time and space themselves as only modifications of it or breathing room in which it exists weaving the thoughts which it calls life death and materiality but be his metaphysical opinions what they may who but some fantastic individual or ultra contemplative scholar ever thinks of subjecting to them his practical notions of bettering his condition and how soon is it likely that men will leave off endeavouring to secure themselves against the uneasier chances of vicissitude even if providence ordains them to do so for no other end than the preservation of vicissitude itself and not in order to help them out of the husk and thorns of action into the flowers of it and into the air of heaven certain it is at all events that the human being is incited to increase his amount of good and that when he is endeavouring to do so he is at least not fulfilling the worst part of his necessity 
nobody tells us when we attempt to put out a fire and to save the lives of our neighbors that conflagration is god's daughter or murder god's daughter on the contrary these are things which christianism is taught to think ill of and to wish to put down and therefore we should put down war which is murder and conflagration by millions to those who tell us that nations would grow cowardly and effeminate without war we answer try a reasonable condition of peace first and then prove it try a state of things which mankind have never yet attained because they had no press and no universal comparison of notes and consider in the meanwhile whether so cheerful and intelligent in just a state seeing fair play between body and mind and educated into habits of activity would be likely to uneducate itself into what was neither respected nor customary prove in the meanwhile that nations are cowardly and effeminate that have been long unaccustomed to war that the south americans are so or that all our robust countrymen who do not go for soldiers are timid agriculturists and manufacturers with not a quoit to throw on the green or a saucy word to give to an insult moral courage is in self-respect and the sense of duty physical courage is a matter of health or organization are these predispositions likely to fail in a community of instructed freemen doubters of advancement are always arguing from a limited past to an unlimited future that is to say from a past of which they know but a point to a future of which they know nothing they stand on the bridge between two eternities seeing a little bit of it behind them and nothing at all of what is before in uttering those words unfit for mortal tongue man ever was and man ever will be they might as well say what is beyond the stars it appears to be a part of the necessity of things from what we see of the improvements they make that all human improvement should proceed by the cooperation of human means but what blinker into the night of next week what luckless profit of the impossibilities of steamboats and steam carriages shall presume to say how far those improvements are to extend let no man faint in the cooperation with which god has honored him as to those superabundances of population which wars and other evils are supposed to be necessary in order to keep down there are questions which have a right to be put long before any such necessity is assumed until those questions be answered and the experiments dependent upon them tried the interrogators have a right to assume that no such necessity exists i do not enter upon them for i am not bound to do so but i have touched upon them in the poem and the too rich and other disingenuous half reasoners know well what they are all passionate remedies for evil are themselves evil and tend to reproduce what they remedy it is high time for the world to show that it has come to man's estate and can put down what is wrong without violence should the wrong still return we should have a right to say with the apostle sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof for meanwhile we should not have done evil that good may come that good may come nay that evil may be perpetuated for what good superior to the alternatives denounced is achieved by this eternal round of war and its causes let us do good in a good and kind manner and trust to the cooperation of providence for the results it seems the only real way of attaining to the very best of which our earth is capable and at the very worst necessity like the waters will find its level and the equity of things be justified i firmly believe that war or the sending thousands of our fellow-creatures 
to cut one another to bits often for what they have no concern in nor understand will one day be reckoned far more absurd than if people were to settle an argument over the dinner table with their knives a logic indeed which was once fashionable in some places during the good old times the world has seen the absurdity of that practice why should it not come to years of discretion with respect to violence on a larger scale the other day our own country and the united states agreed to refer a point in dispute to the arbitration of the king of holland a compliment if we are to believe the newspapers of which his majesty was justly proud he struck a medal on the strength of it which history will show as a set-off against his less creditable attempts to force his opinions upon the belgians why should not every national dispute be referred in like manner to a third party there is reason to suppose that the judgment would stand a good chance of being impartial and it would benefit the character of the judge and dispose him to receive judgments of the same kind till at length the custom would prevail like any other custom and men be astonished at the customs that preceded it in private life none but schoolboys and the vulgar settle disputes by blows even dueling is losing its dignity two nations or most likely two governments have a dispute they reason the point backwards and forwards they cannot determine it perhaps they do not wish to determine so like two carmen in the street they fight it out first however dressing themselves up to look fine and pluming themselves on their absurdity just as if the two carmen were to go and put on their sunday clothes and stick a feather in their hat besides in order to be as dignified and fantastic as possible they then go at it and cover themselves with mud blood and glory can anything be more ridiculous yet apart from the habit of thinking otherwise and being drummed into the notion by the very toys of infancy the similitude is not one atom too ludicrous no nor a thousandth part enough so i am aware that a sarcasm is but a sarcasm and need not imply any argument never includes all but it acquires a more respectable character when so much is done to keep it out of sight when so many questions are begged against it by pride pomp and circumstance and allegations of necessity similar allegations may be and are brought forward by other nations of the world in behalf of customs which we for our parts think very ridiculous and do our utmost to put down never referring them as we refer our own to the mysterious ordinations of providence or if we do never hesitating to suppose that providence in moving us to interfere is varying its ordinations now all that i would ask of the advocates of war is to apply the possible justice of this supposition to their own case for the purpose of thoroughly investigating the question but they will exultingly say perhaps is this a time for investigating the question when military genius even for civil purposes has regained its ascendancy in the person of the duke of wellington when the world has shown that it cannot do without him when whigs radicals liberals of all sorts have proved to be but idle talkers in comparison with this man of few words and many deeds i answer that it remains to be proved whether the ascendancy be gained or not but i have no belief it will be regained and that in the meanwhile never was time fitter for questioning the merits of war and by inference those of its leaders the general peacefulness of the world presents a fair opportunity for laying the foundations of peaceful opinion and the alarm of the moment renders the interrogation desirable for its immediate sake 
the reappearance of a military administration or of an administration barely civil and military at heart may not at first sight be thought the most promising one for hastening a just appreciation of war and the ascendancy of moral over the physical strength but is it or can it be lasting will it not provoke is it not now provoking a reaction still more peremptory against the claims of toryism than the state of things which preceded it is it anything but a flash of success still more indicative of expiring life and caused only by its convulsive efforts if it be this it is easy enough to predict that sir robert peel notwithstanding his abilities and the better ambition which is natural to them and which struggles in him with an inferior one impatient of his origin will turn out to be nothing but a servant of the aristocracy and more or less openly of a barrack master he will be the servant not of the king not of the house of commons but of the house of lords and as long as such influence lasts which can be but a short while of its military leaders he will do nothing whatsoever contrary to their dictation upon peril of being treated worse than canning and all the reform which he is permitted to bring about will be only just as much as will serve to keep off the spirit of it as long as possible and to continue the people in that state of comparative ignorance which is the only safeguard of monopoly every unwilling step of reform will be accompanied with some retrograde or by effort in favor of the abuses reformed cunning occasion will be seized to convert boons demanded by the age into gifts of party favor and bribes for the toleration of what is withheld and as knowledge proceeds to extort public education for extorted it will and in its own way too at last mark and see what attempts will be made to turn knowledge against itself and to catechize the nation back into the schoolboy acquiescence of the good people of germany much good is there in that people i would not be thought to undervalue it much bonhomie and in the most despotic districts as much sensual comfort as can make any people happy who know no other happiness but england and france the leaders of europe the peregrinators of the world cannot be confined to those lazy and prospectless paths they have gone through the feudal reign they must now go through the commercial god forbid that for anybody's sake they should stop there and they will continue to advance till all are instructed and all are masters and government in however gorgeous a shape be truly their servant the problem of existing governments is how to prepare for this inevitable period and to continue to be its masters by converting themselves frankly and truly into its friends for my part as one of the people i confess i like the colors and shows of feudalism and would retain as much of them as would adorn nobler things i would keep the tiger skin though the beast be killed the painted window though the superstition be laid in the tomb nature likes external beauty and man likes it it softens the heart enriches the imagination and helps to show us that there are other goods in the world besides bare utility i would fain see the splendors of royalty combined with the cheapness of a republic and the equal knowledge of all classes is such a combination impossible i would exhort the lovers of feudal splendor to be the last men to think so for a thousand times more impossible will they find its retention under any other circumstances their royalties their educations their accomplishments of all sorts must go along with the press and its irresistible consequences or they will be set aside like a child in a corner who has insisted on keeping the toys and books of his brothers to himself now there is nothing that irritates a just cause 
so much as a threatening of force and all impositions of a military chief on a state where civil directors will at least do as well as a threatening of force disguise it or pretend to laugh at it as its imposers may this irritation in england will not produce violence public opinion is too strong and the future too secure but deeply and daily will increase the disgust and the ridicule and individuals will get laughed at and catechized who cannot easily be sent out of the way as ambassadors and who might as well preserve their self-respect a little better to attempt however quietly to overawe the advance of improvement by the aspect of physical force is as idle as if soldiers were drawn out to suppress the rising of a flood the flood rises quietly irresistibly without violence it cannot help it the waters of knowledge are out and will cover the earth of what use is it to see the representative of a bygone influence a poor individual mortal for he is nothing else in the comparison fretting and fuming on the shore of this mighty sea and playing the part of a canute reversed an antic really taking his flatterers at their word end of postscript containing some remarks on war and military statesmen part one chapter eight of captain sword and captain pen a poem this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Captain Sword and Captain Pen, a poem by Lee Hunt. Postscript, containing some remarks on war and military statesmen, part two. The first 35 years of the 19th century have been rich in experiences of the sure and certain failure of all soldiership and Toryism to go heartily along in the cause of the many there has been the sovereign instance of napoleon bonaparte himself of the allies after him of charles the tenth of louis philippe albeit a schoolmaster and lastly of this strange and most involuntary reformer the duke of wellington who refused to do under canning or for principle's sake what he consented to do when canning died for the sake of regaining power and of keeping it with as few concessions as possible canning perished because toryism or the principle of power for its own sake to which he had been a servant could not bear to acknowledge him as its master his intellect was just great enough as his birth was small enough to render it jealous of him under that aspect there is an instinct in toryism which renders pure intellect intolerable to it except in some inferior or mechanical shape or in the flattery of voluntary servitude but by a like instinct it is not so jealous of military renown it is glad of the doubtful amount of intellect in military genius and knows it to be a good ally in the preservation of power and in the substitution of noise and show for qualities fearless of inspection is it an ascendancy of this kind which the present age requires or will permit do we want a soldier at the head of us when there is nobody abroad to fight with when international as well as national questions can manifestly settle themselves without him and when his appearance in the seat of power can indicate nothing but a hankering after those old substitutions of force for argument or at best of an authority for a reason which every step of reform is hoping to do away do we want him to serve in our shops to preside over our studies to cultivate peace and good will among nations wounding no self-love threatening no social there never was a soldier purely brought up as such and it is of such only i speak and not of rare and even then perilous exceptions men educated in philosophy like epaminondas or in homely household virtues and in citizenship like washington but there never was a soldier such as i speak of who did not more for the world than was compatible with his confined and arbitrary breeding i do not speak of course with reference to the unprofessional part of his character 
circumstances especially the participation of dangers and vicissitudes often conspire with naturally good qualities to render soldiers the most amiable of men and nothing is more delightful to contemplate than an old military veteran whose tenderness of heart has survived the shocks of the rough work it had been tried in till twenty miserable sights of the war and horror start up to the imagination as a set-off against its attractiveness but publicly speaking the more a soldier succeeds the more he looks upon soldiership as something superior to all other kinds of ascendancy and qualified to dispense with them he always ends in considering the flower of the art of government as consisting in issuing orders and that of popular duty as comprised in obedience cities with him are barracks and the nation is a conquered country he is at best but a pioneer of civilization when he undertakes to be the civilizer himself he makes mistakes that betray him to others even supposing him self-deceived napoleon though he was the accidental instrument of a popular reaction was one of the educated tools of the system that provoked it an officer brought up at a royal military college and in spite of his boasted legislation and his real genius such he ever remained he did as much for his own aggrandizement as he could and no more for the world than he thought compatible with it the same military genius which made him as great as he was stopped him short of a greater greatness because quick in imposing as he was in acting the part of a civil ruler he was in reality a soldier and nothing else and by the excess of the soldier's propensity aggrandizement by force he overtoppled himself and fell to pieces soldiership appears to have narrowed or hardened the public spirit of every man who has spent the chief part of his life in it who has died at an age which gives final proofs of its tendency and whose history is thoroughly known we all know what cromwell did to an honest parliament marlborough ended in being a miser and the tool of his wife even good-natured heroic nelson condescended to become an executioner at naples frederick did much for prussia as power but what became of her as a people a power either before the popular power of france even washington seemed not to comprehend those who thought that negro slaves ought to be freed in the name of common sense then what do we want with a soldier who was born and bred in circumstances the most arbitrary who never advocated a liberal measure as long as he could help it and who without meaning to speak presumptuously or in one's own person unauthorized by opinion is one of the merest soldiers though a great one that never existed without genius of any other sort with scarcely a civil public quality either commanding or engaging as far as the world in general can see and with no more to say for himself than the most mechanical clerk in office in what respect is the duke of wellington better fitted to be a parliamentary leader than the sir arthur wellesley of twenty years back or what has recast the habits and character of colonel wellesley of the east indies to give him an unprofessional consideration for the lives and liberties of his fellow creatures and yet the duke of wellington it is said may after all be in earnest in his professions of reform and advancement if so he will be the most remarkable instance that ever existed of the triumph of reason over the habits of life and the experience of mankind i have looked for some such men through a very remarkable period of the world when an honest declaration to this effect would have set him at the top of mankind to be worshipped for ever and i never found the glorious opportunity seized not by napoleon when he came from elba not by his allies when they conquered him not by louis philippe though he was educated in adversity i mean that he has shown himself a prince born of the most aristocratic kind and evidently considers himself as nothing but the head of a new dynasty when the duke of wellington had the opportunity of being a reformer of his own free will he resisted it as long as he could he opposed reform up to the last moment of its freedom from his dictation he declared that ruin would follow it and that the institutions of the country were perfect without it and that at the very least the less of it the better and for this enmity even if no other reason existed even if his new light were sincere the duke of wellington ought not to have the honor of leading reform 
it is just as if a man had been doing all he could to prevent another from entering his own house and then when he found that the bystanders would insist on his having free passage were to turn to them smiling and say well since it must be so allow me to do the honors of the mansion everybody knows that this proposal will be called by the bystanders and if the way in which greatness is brought up and spoilt gives it a right to a less homely style of rebuke as i grant it does still the absurdity of the duke's claim is not the less evident nor the error of it less provoking i can imagine but two reasons for the remotest possible permission of this glaring anomaly this government of anti-reforming reformers this hospital of sick guides for the healthy supported by involuntary contributions first sheer necessity which is ludicrous and second a facilitation of church reform through the lords and the bench of bishops the desirableness of which facilitation appears to be in no proportion to the compromise it is likely to make with abuses i have read i believe all the utmost possible things that can be said in its favor the articles for instance written by the times newspaper admirable as far as a rotten cause can let them be and when not afflicted by some portentous mystery of personal resentment and though i trust i may lay claim to as much willingness to be convinced as most men who have suffered and reflected i have not seen a single argument which did not appear to me fully answered by the above objection alone about the honour setting aside the innumerable convincing ones urged by the reasoners on the other side for as to any dearth of statesmen in a country like this it never existed nor ever can till education and public spirit have entirely left it there have been the same complaints at every change in the history of administrations and the crop has never failed let me state here that any appearance of personality in this book is involuntary public principles are sometimes incarnate in individual shapes and in attacking them the individual may be seemingly attacked where to eyes which look a little closer there is evidently no such intention i have been obliged to identify in some measure the power of the sword with several successive individuals and with the duke of wellington most because he is the reigning shape and includes all its pretensions but as an individual who am nothing except in connection with what i humanly feel i dare to affirm that i have not only the consideration that becomes me for all human beings but a flesh and blood regard for everybody and that i as truly respect in the noble duke the possession of military science of a straightforward sincerity and a valour of which no circumstances or years can diminish the ready firmness as i doubt the fitness of a man of his education habits and political principles for the guidance of an intellectual age i dislike toryism because i think it an unjust exacting and pernicious thing which tends to keep the interests of the many in perpetual subjection to those of the few but far be it from me in common modesty to dislike those who have been brought up in its principles and taught to think them good far less such of them as adorn it by intellectual or moral qualities and who justly claim for it under its best aspect in private life that ease and urbanity of behaviour which implies an acknowledgment of its claims to respect even where those claims are partly grounded in prejudice i heartily grant to the privileged class that enjoying in many respects the best educations they have been conservators of polished manners and of the other graces of intercourse my quarrel with them is that the inferior part of their education induces them to wish to keep these manners and graces to themselves together with superabundance good for nobody of all other advantages and that thus instead of being the preservers of a beautiful and genial flame good for all and in due season partakeable by all they would hoard and make an idolatrous treasure of it sacred to one class alone and such as the diffusion of knowledge renders it alike useless and exasperating to endeavour to withhold i will conclude this postscript with quotations from three writers of the present day who may be fairly taken to represent the three distinct classes of the leaders of knowledge and who will show what is thought of the feasibility of putting an end to war the utilitarian or those who are all for the tangible and material 
the metaphysical, are those who recognize, in addition, the spiritual and imaginative wants of mankind. And lastly, in no offensive sense, the men of the world, whose opinion will have the greatest weight of all with the incredulous, and whose speaker is a soldier to boot, and a man who evidently sees fair play to all the weaknesses as well as the strengths of our nature. The first quotation is from the venerable Mr. Bentham, a man who certainly lost sight of no existing or possible phase of society, such as the ordinary disputants on this subject contemplate. I venture to think him not thoroughly philosophical on the point, especially in what he says in reproach of men educated to think differently from himself. But the passage will show the growth of opinion in a practical and highly influential quarter. Nothing can be worse, says Mr. Bentham, than the general feeling on the subject of war. The church, the state, the ruling few, the subject many, all seem to have combined in order to patronize vice and crime in their very widest sphere of evil. Dress a man in particular garments, call him by a particular name, and he shall have authority on diverse occasions to commit every species of offense, to pillage, to murder, to destroy human felicity, and for so doing he shall be rewarded. Of all that is pernicious in admiration, the admiration of heroes is the most pernicious, and how delusion should have made us admire what virtue should teach us to hate and loathe is among the saddest evidences of human weakness and folly. The crimes of heroes seem lost in the vastness of the field they occupy. A lively idea of the mischief they do, of the misery they create, seldom penetrates the mind through the delusions with which thoughtfulness and falsehood have surrounded their names and deeds. Is it that the magnitude of the evil is too gigantic for entrance? We read of twenty thousand men killed in battle, with no other feeling than that it was a glorious victory. Twenty thousand, or ten thousand. What reck we of their sufferings? The hosts who perished are evidence of the completeness of the triumph, and the completeness of the triumph is the measure of merit, and the glory of the conqueror. Our schoolmasters, and the immoral books they so often put into our hands, have inspired us with an affection for heroes, and the hero is more heroic in proportion to the numbers of the slain. Add a cipher. Not one iota is added to our disapprobation. Four or two figures give us no more sentiment of pain than one figure, while they add marvelously to the grandeur and splendor of the victor. Let us draw forth one individual from those thousands, or tens of thousands, his leg has been shivered by one ball, his jaw broken by another. He is bathed in his own blood and that of his fellows. Yet he lives, tortured by thirst, fainting, famishing. He is but one of the twenty thousand, one of the actors and sufferers in the scene of the hero's glory. And of the twenty thousand, there is scarcely one whose suffering or death will not be the center of a circle of misery. Look again, admirers of that hero. Is not this wretchedness? Because it is repeated ten, ten hundred, ten thousand times, is not this wretchedness? The period will surely arrive when better instructed generations will require all the evidence of history to credit that in times deeming themselves enlightened, human beings should have been honored with public approval in the very proportion of the misery they caused and the mischiefs they perpetrated. They will call upon all the testimony which incredulity can require to persuade them that in past ages men there were, men too deemed worthy of popular recompense, who for some small pecuniary retribution hired themselves out to do any deeds of pillage, devastation, and murder which might be demanded of them. And still more will it shock their sensibilities to learn that such men, such men destroyers, were marked out as the eminent and the illustrious as the worthy of laurels and monuments, of eloquence and poetry, in that better and happier epoch, the wise and the good will be busied in hurling into oblivion, or dragging forth for exposure to universal ignominy and obliquy. Many of the heads we deem heroic, while the true fame for the perdurable glories will be gathered around the creators and the diffusers of happiness. Deontology. Our second quotation is from one of the subtlest and most universal thinkers now living, Thomas Carlyle, G. 
chiefly known to the public as a German scholar and the friend of Goethe, but deeply respected by other leading intellects of the day, as a man who sees into the utmost recognized possibilities of knowledge, see what he thinks of war, and the possibility of putting an end to it. We forget whether we got the extract from the Edinburgh or the Foreign Quarterly Review, having made it some time back and mislaid the reference, and we take a liberty with him in mentioning his name as the writer, for which his zeal in the cause of mankind will assuredly pardon us. The better minds of all countries, observes Mr. Carlyle, begin to understand each other, and which follows naturally to love each other and help each other, by whom ultimately all countries in all their proceedings are governed. Late in man's history, yet clearly at length, it becomes manifest to the dullest that mind is stronger than matter, that mind is the creator and shaper of matter, that not brute force, but only persuasion and faith is the king of this world. The true poet, who is but an inspired thinker, is still an Orpheus, whose lyre tames the savage beasts, and evokes the dead rocks to fashion themselves into palaces and stately inhabited cities. It has been said, and may be repeated, that literature is fast becoming all in all to us, our church, our senate, our whole social constitution. The true pope of Christendom is not that feeble old man in Rome, nor is its autocrat the Napoleon, the Nicholas, with its half-million, even of obedient bayonets. Such autocrat is himself, but a more cunningly devised bayonet and military engine in the hands of a mightier than he. The true autocrat, or pope, is that man, the real or seeming wisest of the last age, crowned after death, who finds his hierarchy of gifted authors, his clergy of assiduous journalists, whose decretals written not on parchment but on the living souls of men, it were an inversion of the laws of nature to disobey. In those times of ours, all intellect has fused itself into literature. Literature, printed thought, is the molten sea and wonder-bearing chaos in which mind after mind casts forth its opinion, its feeling, to be molten into the general mass, and to be worked there. Interest after interest is engulfed in it, or embarked in it. Higher, higher it rises round all the edifices of existence. They must all be molten into it, and anew bodied forth from it, or stand unconsumed among its fiery surges. Woe to him whose edifice is not built of true asbest and on the everlasting rock, but on the false sand and the driftwood of accident, and the paper and parchment of antiquated habit. For the power, or powers, exist not on our earth that can say to that sea, roll back, or bid its proud waves be still. What form so omnipotent an element will assume? How long it will welter to and fro as a wild democracy, a wilder anarchy, what constitution and organization it will fashion for itself, and for what depends on it in the depths of time, is a subject for prophetic conjecture, wherein brightest hope is not unmingled with fearful apprehensions and awe at the boundless unknown. The more cheering is this one thing, which we do see and know, that its tendency is to a universal European common will, that the wisest in all nations will communicate and cooperate, whereby Europe will again have its true sacred college and council of amethyctons. Wars will become rarer, less inhuman, and in the course of centuries such delirious ferocity in nations as in individuals it already is, may be proscribed and become obsolete forever. My last and not least conclusive extract, for it shows the actual hold which these speculations have taken of the minds of practical men, of men out in the world, and even soldiers, is from a book popular among all classes of readers, The Bubbles from the Brunens of Nassau, written by Major Sir Francis Head. What he says of one country's educating another, by the natural progress of books and opinion, and of the effect which this is likely to have upon governments, even as remote and unwilling as Russia, is particularly worthy of attention. The author is speaking of some bathers at whom he had been looking and of a Russian prince, who lets us into some curious information respecting the leading strings in which grown gentlemen are kept by despotism. For more than half an hour I had been indolently watching this amphibious scene, when the landlord, entering my room, said, 
that the russian prince g in wished to speak to me on some business and the information was scarcely communicated when i perceived his highness standing at the threshold of my door with the attention due to his rank i instantly begged he would do me the honour to walk in and after we had sufficiently bowed to each other and that i had prevailed on my guest to sit down i gravely requested him as i stood before him to be so good as to state in what way i could have the good fortune to render him any service the prince very briefly replied that he had called upon me considering that i was the person in the hotel best capable he politely inclined his head of informing him by what route it would be most advisable for him to proceed to london it being his wish to visit my country in order at once to solve this very simple problem i silently unfolded and spread out upon the table my map of europe and each of us as we leant over it placing a forefinger on or near wiesbaden our eyes being fixed upon dover we remained in this reflecting attitude for some seconds until the prince's finger first solemnly began to trace its route in doing this i observed his highness hand kept swerving far into the netherlands so gently pulling it by the thumb towards paris i used as much force as i thought decorous to induce it to advance in a straight line however finding my efforts ineffectual i ventured with respectful astonishment to ask why travel by so uninteresting a route the prince at once acknowledged that the route i had recommended would by visiting paris afford him the greatest pleasure but he frankly told me that no russian not even a personage of his rank could enter that capital without first obtaining a written permission from the emperor those words were no sooner uttered than i felt my fluent civility suddenly begin to coagulate the attention i paid my guest became forced and unnatural i was no longer at my ease and though i bowed strained and endeavoured to be if possible more respectful than ever yet i really could hardly prevent my lips from muttering aloud that i had sooner die a homely english peasant than live to be a russian prince in short his highness's words acted upon my mind like thunder upon beer and moreover i could almost have sworn that i was an old lean wolf contemptuously observing a bald ring rubbed by the collar from the neck of a sleek well-fed mastiff dog however recovering myself i managed to give as much information as it was in my humble power to afford and my noble guest then taking his departure i returned to my open window to give vent in solitude as i gazed upon the horse bath to my own reflection upon the subject although the petty rule of my life has been never to trouble myself about what the world calls politics a fine word by the by much easier expressed than understood yet i must own i am always happy when i see a nation enjoying itself and melancholy when i observe any large body of people suffering pain or imprisonment but of all sorts of imprisonment that of the mind is to my taste the most cruel and therefore when i consider over what immense dominions the emperor of russia presides and how he governs i cannot help sympathizing most sincerely with those innocent sufferers who have the misfortune to be born his subjects for if a russian prince be not freely permitted to go to paris in what a melancholy state of slavery and debasement must exist the minds of what we call the lower classes as a sovereign remedy for this lamentable political disorder many very sensible people in england prescribe i know that we ought to have resource to arms i must confess however it seems to me that one of the greatest political errors england could commit would be to declare are to join in declaring war with russia in short that an appeal to brute force would at this moment be at once most unscientifically to stop an immense moral engine which if left to its work is quite powerful enough without bloodshed to gain for humanity at no expense at all its object the individual who is i conceive to overthrow the emperor of russia who is to direct his own legions against himself who is to do what napoleon had at the head of his great army failed to effect is the little child who lighted by the single wick of a small lamp sits at this moment perched above the great steam press of the penny magazine feeding it from morning till night with blank papers which at almost every pulsation of the engine comes out stamped on both sides with engravings 
and with pages of plain useful harmless knowledge which by making the lower orders acquainted with foreign lands foreign productions various states of society etc tend practically to inculcate glory to god in the highest and on earth peace good will towards men it has already been stated that what proceeds from this press is now greedily devoured by the people of europe indeed even at berlin we know it can hardly be reprinted fast enough this child then this sweet little cherub that sits up aloft is the only army that an enlightened country like ours should i humbly think deign to oppose to one who reigns in darkness who trembles at daylight whose throne rests upon ignorance and despotism compare this mild peaceful intellectual policy with the dreadful savage alternative of going to war and the difference must surely be evident to every one in the former case we calmly enjoy first of all the pleasing reflection that our country is generously imparting to the nations of europe the blessing she is tranquilly deriving from the purification of civilization to her own mind far from wishing to exterminate we are gradually illuminating the russian peasant we are madly throwing a gleam of light upon the fetters of the russian prince and surely every well-disposed person must see that if we will only have patience the result of this noble temperate conduct must produce all that reasonable beings can desire bubbles from brunens of nassau page one sixty four by the penny magazine our author means of course not only that excellent publication but all cheaply diffused knowledge all the tranquil and lightning deeds of captain pen in general of whom it is pleasant to see the gallant major so useful a servant the more so from his sympathies with rank and aristocracy but pen will make it a matter of necessity by and by for all ranks to agree with him in vindication of their own wit and common sense and when once this necessity is felt and fastidiousness shall find out that it will be considered absurd to lag behind in the career of knowledge and the common good the cause of the world is secure may princes and people alike find it out by the kindliest means and without further violence may they discover that no one set of human beings perhaps no single individual can be thoroughly secure and content or enabled to work out his case with equal reasonableness till all are so a subject for reflection which contains we hope the beneficent reason why all are restless the solution of the problem is cooperation the means of solving it is the press if the greeks had had a press we should probably have heard nothing of the inconsiderate question which demands why they with all their philosophy did not alter the world they had not the means they could not command a general hearing neither had christianity come up to make men think of another's wants as well as of their own accomplishments modern times possess those means and inherit that divine incitement may every man exert himself accordingly and show himself a worthy inhabitant of this beautiful and most capable world end of section eight end of captain sword and captain pen a poem by lee hunt